from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont, online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, the House approves a bill that inserts the legislature into the State Department of Environmental Protection's plans to comply with U.S. EPA carbon emission standards. That measure now goes to the Senate, where passage is expected. And a year after the Kanawha Valley water crisis, things are back to normal for the 300,000 West Virginians affected. But some residents of McDowell County are just getting clean water after years without. A special report on water and more coming up on the legislature today today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. The legislature wants an audit of the Division of Highways to find cost-saving measures. Initially, the cost of the audit, up to $500,000, would come from the state road fund. But after an outcry from many legislators who said those funds should go to road maintenance, that dollar figure was removed from the bill. The audit would be put out for bid, and the firm with the lowest bid would get the contract, with the money coming from the legislature itself. Liz McCormick has that story and other news from the House today. Today in the House, three bills were up for passage. First was House Bill 2004, which would require a procedure for the development of a state plan in regard to the Clean Air Act. Currently, the Environmental Protection Agency requires a 20 percent decrease in carbon emissions by the year 2030 for the whole country. Delegate John Schott, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, explained that in the EPA's proposed rule, it requires a state to follow a set of four building blocks to reach this goal. However, he said the building blocks don't add for much wiggle room for West Virginia. It requires limiting and reducing energy used by West Virginia residents and citizens. Let me say that again. It requires limiting and reducing energy used by West Virginia residents and citizens. This is greater than just a coal debate. This is a de debate about the federal EPA telling citizens how much energy they can use in their own homes. Schott says this bill would help aid in some pushback toward the EPA and give the state a little more control. It would require the Department of Environmental Protection to submit a report to the legislature determining whether a state plan from the EPA is feasible. This in turn would allow for development of a proposed state plan to be reviewed and considered by the legislature before submission to the EPA. In sum, the proposed EPA rule is an improper intrusion upon the people of this state. We as the legislature are the people's eyes and ears and directly accountable them for the laws and policies of our state. In passing this bill, we are properly exercising our role as a legislature and ensuring that the energy policies of this state are given appropriate review and consideration and not forced upon us by the EPA. House Bill 2004 passed overwhelmingly, 93 to 3. Delegates Barbara Fleshauer, Mike Pushkin, and Stephen Skinner voted against. Next was House Bill 2008, auditing the Division of Highways. Delegate Eric Nelson, the chair of House Finance, thinks this bill will help fix up West Virginia roads. The original bill took $500,000 out of the state road fund to pay for the audit. That amount has been removed from the bill, and now the legislature will pay for the audit from its accounts. The biggest thing we did is we took this out of the Department of Highways as far as the cost of this audit. Uh, we all know that we have issues with our, the maintenance of our roads and whatnot and did not feel that that needed to be a burden of the Department of Highways and instead this will be an expense of the Joint Committee. Uh, a couple of other points. Um, the last independent audit of the Department of Highways was completed in 2005. And before our committee, both Secretary Maddox and the legislative auditor both expressed support for the independent audit. I uh, urge passage, Mr. Speaker. Delegate Amy Summers of Taylor County stood to support Nelson's bill. We've put roads on the back burner for too long. 
The audit of the Department of Highways is the initial step to evaluate our needs and develop a plan. Infrastructure can no longer be ignored. I urge support of House Bill 2008. Delegate Tim Miley, the minority leader, also stood to support the bill, but he inquired about the last independent audit done in 2005. Has anyone followed up to determine whether the recommendations following the audit in 2005 have been implemented, uh, were implemented and are currently being followed? The Secretary has mentioned that uh, I think a lot of his plans over these last 10 years have been because of that audit in 2005. And are, is, is the Secretary finding positive results coming from following the recommendations? Uh, he'd like a lot more money. <laughs> I hope you have an answer for that. <laughs> Thank you. House Bill 2008 passed 96 to 0. The last bill on third reading was House Bill 2151. This bill would make the West Virginia Teacher of the Year an ex officio, non-voting member of the West Virginia Board of Education. The bill would also require two members of the Board of Education to be parents of children currently in the school system. This bill also passed, but with one rejection vote from Delegate Mike Azinger from Wood County. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Bills were introduced in both chambers this week that interest groups worry may weaken the above-ground storage tank law that was approved by lawmakers last year. The bill's sponsors say they want to make it easier for tank owners to comply with the law. So instead of a broad focus, the new bill says the State Department of Environmental Protection will only oversee tanks containing 10,000 gallons of a liquid or more in a zone of critical concern or near a drinking water supply that aren't already regulated by another program. DEP Secretary Randy Huffman said earlier this week the change would leave thousands of tanks unregulated. His department has already submitted regulatory program specifics to the legislature for approval, and today he announced fees, which could total as much as $400 per year for some tanks. Last year's measure came after the water crisis when chemicals from a tank farm in Charleston leaked into the Canal River. Hundreds of thousands of West Virginians in Charleston and the surrounding area went without safe drinking water in their homes. But for some residents in southern West Virginia, boil water advisories and sometimes no water at all is a way of life. A few projects began this year that are expected to bring relief. In Wyoming County, a project will bring consistent water to citizens in Bud, Alpoca, and Herndon Consolidated Elementary School. Jessica Lilly was there for a groundbreaking ceremony of a project in McDowell County and has this report. A coal miner's daughter, Betty Younger, grew up in McDowell County and remembers a very different community during the 1950s. Younger sits on her front porch, which sits close to Route 52, a road busy with coal trucks. She reminisces about her days in the Kyle coal camp. It was. It was fun times for us. I mean, it, the, the community was plentiful because there were so many children around and it was just a, you know, it was just a fun time for school and all. We all rode the school buses together and it was just a big community of, of happiness. Everybody, every neighbor looked out for each other and it was such a difference then than it is now. Like so many coal-dependent communities, McDowell has suffered the boom and bust of the industry and a sharp population decline. In the 1950s, there were more than 100,000 people. Today, less than 20,000 remain in the county. This part of McDowell County is uh, looked upon like, you know, there's, uh, what's here? Well, I mean, there's nothing here. No one wants to come back here to stay. They come back to visit, but no one wants to come here and back to really to live in uh, uh, certain sections of McDowell County. We just don't have like we should, like we once had. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, I don't know, <laughs> but it, it's home. And, and I still love it because it's where I was born and reared here, so I still love it. It'll always be my home. It'll always be my home. Younger has lived in this home in Elkhorn for about six years. There have been so many issues with the water, she just assumes not to drink it and says she rarely uses it for cooking. But the quality of the water is the least of her worries. We never know when we're not going to have water. It's just, you know, day to day. We keep jugs filled. We, for every jug that we get, gallon jugs of, of water and juices that we buy, the, main, main, the majority of us have porches and, and our basement, those that have basement, we have water jugs filled 
to capacity because we never know when we're not going to have water. And that's the story for several communities in the region. While winter months can be particularly hard because of freezing pipes, water outages could happen in places like Elkhorn, Keystone, or North Fork any time of the year. Sometimes uh, the water is off for like now it's off for like three or four days and and we don't have, you know, we don't have access to water like other places do. And uh, the, because of the, the pipes, are, they're so old, and so they have to be replaced. But in the meantime, people are going, they're suffering because you have to get up, you need water to get up to, to uh, get ready for work in the morning. You, to drink water, you have to go out and buy water out of your pocket now because the water system is not, it's not flowing like it should. This past summer, a project that residents have been hearing about for years finally broke ground. <laughs> phase one of what's being called the Elkhorn Water Project. When all three phases are complete, the project will replace the system that younger and other residents currently rely on. Phase one will replace a leaky, rusty tank that is believed to date back to the 1940s, set up by coal companies of that day. Younger's house sits just beyond the phase one project. But like so many folks in the region, she's thankful for what she does have. To Younger and other folks, it's a way of life. I try not to complain, and then I just, you know, just, and just ask the Lord to bless us and keep us that we have water when we need water. Our, our ambition and our, our goal is to provide as much clean water as we can for every citizen of McDowell County. That's Eldon Green, Assistant Director of McDowell County Public Service District after the groundbreaking ceremony last year. We are very grateful for how that through the slow moving bureaucratic process of the government we're finally seeing this good thing happen in our county today. Green is proud to say the district started out with 500 customers in 1990 and has more than 3,000 customers today. There's a crumbling, decaying, almost non-existent uh, water system in the area and, and not even all of our uh, customers or, 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 or households have uh, that public water. Some have springs and, and wells. Uh, but as with any rural community where the major industry has come and gone, we, we face uh, negative things, we face low incomes, we face uh, dilapidated housing, and uh, it's just been a terrible, terrible struggle. Phase one will bring water to Elkhorn, Mayberry, and Switchback. The McDowell County PSD is working to find funding for several other projects like this one throughout the county. The Big Sandy Rotorfield extension will bring clean water to Green's own home. He currently has a deep well. I have a water treatment system personally that uh, is salt based and they say over the long term that's not good. But uh, we're thankful for what we, ha what we have. The first phase of the project was funded by grants and loans from the United States Department of Agriculture, Rural Development. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Jessica Lilly in Elkhorn. In a moment, we'll check in with our State House colleagues about the stories they covered this week. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 425 to provide West Virginia University, Marshall University, and the Osteopathic School of Medicine with more authority to invest assets. Senate Bill 427, to increase the longevity pay for members of the state police. The bill provides for certain increases in pay if certain educational attainment is met by members of the state police. Senate Bill 428, to permit an oral pharmaceutical certified licensees, advanced practice registered nurses, and physician's assistants to prescribe hydrocodone combination drugs for a duration of no more than three days. Senate Bill 430, to give family law practitioners and family law judges a method of enforcing no-contact orders in situations not rising to the level of domestic violence, with the objective of de-escalating tense family situations. And Senate Bill 434, to require approval of televised racing days and simulcast contracts by the Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association, reduce racing days, and eliminate certain restrictions on monies placed in the purse fund. 
up for passage in the Senate on Monday, Senate Bill 287, to provide for the awarding of a posthumous high school diploma to parents of a high school senior who dies during the senior year, and House Bill 2002, to establish the comparative fault standard and abolish joint liability. On second reading, Senate Bill 255, the governor's bill to eliminate boards, councils, task forces, commissions, and committees that are unnecessary, inactive, or redundant. Senate Bill 267, the governor's bill to eliminate the governor's office of health enhancement and lifestyle planning. Senate Bill 357, creating the Coal Jobs and Safety Act of 2015. Senate Bill 361, eliminating the prevailing hourly wage requirements for construction of public improvements. And House Bill 2025, prohibiting certain sex offenders from loitering within 1,000 feet of a school or child care facility. Senators fought long and hard this week over a repeal of the state's prevailing wage and exemptions for vaccines, while members of the House focused on abortion regulations and reforming the state's judicial system. Here to talk about some of these issues and the many others that are still on the back burner are two members of the Capitol Press Corps. David Beard writes for the Dominion Post in Morgantown and Eric Eyre for the Charleston Gazette. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. David, let's start with the abortion bill. There was a public hearing in the House yesterday, and then the Health Committee took it up right afterwards. Mm -hmm. Very long meeting. What did they discuss? At the uh, public hearing, uh, 27 people spoke against the bill. Eight people spoke for it. The arguments are what you would expect a doctor, legislature's business in interfering in the decision between a woman and her doctor, maybe baby's right to to life, um, whether the bill is constitutional or not, those kind of things. We had clergy speaking on both sides, women had had abortions speaking on both sides, lawyers speaking on both sides. So it's nothing unusual in that kind of debate. In, yeah, an interesting discussion over there. Now, House Judiciary took the bill up this afternoon, and they were still meeting when you came over today, but yeah. what were mm. they talking about? Again, it was a lot of the same issues that the House Health Committee brought up, uh, whether there's 11 uh, uh, findings, legislative findings at the beginning of the bill dealing with the, the science of uh, fetal pain and whether uh, unborn children age up to age 20 weeks or sorry, past age 20 weeks past fer- fertilization can uh, feel pain. And there was a long dispute yesterday and today over whether that those 11 findings were in fact scientific fact uh, doctors on both sides testified to that. Um, there was, uh, again, a very emotional amendment was proposed to uh, protect or exempt uh, women who were raped or experienced and suffered incest uh, from, exempt them from this bill. And it, both times it, it failed. Hmm. We also heard, we listened in this afternoon for a little bit, and somebody tried to make an amendment pushing it to 24 weeks because of the constitutionality that Governor Tomlin vetoed last year, saying 24 weeks or viability is that right. cut off. Yeah. And that failed overwhelmingly. It did. Are we looking at an override? Are we looking at a veto override? Do you think that's I, what's going to happen? I, I think we're looking at a veto override. There was a doctor who spoke today. He's a, I forget his uh, profession, but he deals with uh, uh, maternal fetal issues. And uh, he said that the science now shows viability about 23 weeks, but that's still a week shy of what the bill's looking at. So I think we're, again, looking at uh, at a veto. Uh, The governor's promised that. And uh, then I think the Republicans and and the conservative Democrats who support this bill have enough uh, enough votes to override this time around. We expect that to happen. Eric, you've been covering and following a bill, uh, the naloxone bill. It's a drug that redu- or that reverses the overdose, o- reverses overdoses. And that has a companion bill that still hasn't made it through yet. Can you tell us about that legislation? Yeah, the companion bill uh, is called the Good Samaritan Bill. And what it says is that if you are a witness uh, to somebody who overdoses, and we're talking about um, opioid overdoses, which would be prescription painkillers and um, heroin, that if you call 911, you'd be immune from any sort of prosecution for drug charges if they find drug paraphernalia. The, the other bill is, as you said, the naloxone bill. 
and that is a special drug that reverses the effects of overdoses. And what that would do for the first time, right now, ambulance drivers and doctors can administer it, but what that would do would put it in the hands of police, firefighters, and not only that, but family members um, and uh, relatives and caregivers of a person who is addicted to the drugs. So they're saying that if the bills are both together, they'll work. If they're not together, they won't work. And right now, um, they seem to be both moving forward, although there's some hiccups with the Good Samaritan bill. I think the Good Samaritan bill, I think, in the House is a governor's bill. Senator Stallings in the Senate is a big supporter of this bill as well, both Democrats. Are Republicans willing to support the measure? Well, that's interesting you, that you ask because there are similar bills on both issues, one being pushed, they're sponsored by Republicans, and the, then you have the governor's bill, but they essentially do the same thing. It seems to be there might be some, uh, you know, talk among the Republicans that we don't want to have it come out that, you know, we supported the governor's bill, so here's our own bill. But if you look at the two bills, they're almost identical. So, David, you've also been covering charter schools, and the Senate Education Committee has really been working that bill this week. Mm -hmm. Where does it stand now? Uh, it's up for the amendment stage starting Tuesday when the Education Committee meets again on, I think it was just yesterday, they met and heard from uh, a representative of the State Superintendent's Office, Gail Manchin, the President of the School Board, and Howard O'Call with, with the School Board Association. And I think the big surprise that came out of that meeting was that uh, in drafting this bill, none of those three entities have been consulted for input. Um, that rather surprised and shocked some of the, the senators at the meeting, but all three expressed a willingness to work with the committee. Um, uh, a representative for the superintendent's office said he's supportive of the general concept of uh, charter schools, but they have some concerns about some of the details. Uh, Gail Manchin said uh, along the same thing. Uh, with each county being responsible f as a, an authorizer for uh, a, a public school, that there could be 55 different programs. And so the, uh, the, the board would like some input in the policy to make sure that there's some co cohesion. Right, they're asking the board, asking the state superintendent to oversee these schools and yet bringing them to the table at the last day. So it'll be interesting to see what input they have next week and yeah. if we see any changes due to that. David Beard with the Dominion Post, Eric Eyre with the Charleston Gazette. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Now here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 2633, to provide funding for substance abuse services through increased taxes on beer, wine, and liquor. House Bill 2634, to raise the tax on tobacco and tobacco-related products by $1. House Bill 2636, to protect the privacy of concealed weapon permit holders by exempting permits from the Freedom of Information Act. House Bill 2642, to establish a maximum ratio of the number of employees of the West Virginia Department of Education to the number of students enrolled in the state after June 30, 2018, at not greater than one employee to 2,000 students. House Bill 2643, the right to work law, to prohibit employers and labor unions from requiring employees to become or remain members of labor unions as a condition of employment. House Bill 2646, to legalize and regulate the selling of fireworks and create the West Virginia Veterans Program Fund, to impose a special fee on the sale of fireworks and use the proceeds for the fund. House Bill 2653, to prohibit a law enforcement agency from using an unmanned aircraft for surveillance of a person or business property without a warrant. House Bill 2654, to prohibit a government entity from obtaining the location information of an electronic device without a warrant. Up for passage in the House on Monday, House Bill 2011, the deliberate intent bill requiring proof that an employer had deliberately intended to injure an employee in respect to insurance claims. Among the bills on second reading, House Bill 2005, to clarify and update alternative programs for the education of teachers, and House Bill 2224, to provide that historical reenactors are not violating the prohibition against unlawful military organizations. 
There's a public hearing at 9 a.m. in the House chamber on Monday relating to House Bill 2006, making modifications to the Medical Professional Liability Act. This has been the Legislature Today. We'll be back next week with news and information from this session as it approaches the halfway point. We welcome your comments. You can email us at feedback at wvpublic.org. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont, online at wvhtf.org.